Jerome K. Jerome, An Introduction An early life of poverty, exacerbated by the death of his parents in his early teens, helped to cruelly mould the young Jerome. After early stints on the railways, as an actor, a journalist, a schoolteacher, a writer and a solicitor's clerk, he had some minor success with a collection of comic memoirs, on the stage and off, about his earlier experience as an actor. Shortly thereafter, he married, and his honeymoon on the Thames became the inspiration for Three Men in a Boat. This, of course, was a wild success, both critically and commercially, but also perhaps his creative high point. Although he was now able to write full-time, he was never able to attain all the heights of that classic humorous novel. However, he was prolific at the shorter form, and it is from that rich seam that these stories have been mined. These stories are brought to your ears by James Taylor. The Absent-Minded Man by Jerome K. Jerome You ask him to dine with you on Thursday to meet a few people who are anxious to know him. Now, don't make a muddle of it, you say, recollectful of former mishaps, and come on the Wednesday. He laughs good-naturedly as he hunts through the room for his diary. "'Shan't be able to come Wednesday,' he says. "'Shall be at the mansion house, sketching dresses. "'And on Friday I start for Scotland, "'so as to be at the opening of the exhibition on Saturday. "'And then it's bound to be all right this time. "'Where the deuce is that diary? "'Ah, never mind. "'I'll make a note of it on this. Ah, "'You can see me do it.' "'You stand over him, while he writes the appointment down on a sheet of foolscap, and watch him pin it up over his desk. Then you come away contented. I do hope he'll turn up, you say to your wife on the Thursday evening, while dressing. Are you sure you made it clear to him? she replies suspiciously. "'and you instinctively feel that whatever happens "'she is going to blame you for it. Eight o'clock arrives, and with it the other guests. "'At half-past eight your wife is beckoned mysteriously out of the room, "'where the parlour-maid informs her that the cook has expressed a determination, "'in case of further delay, to wash her hands,' figuratively speaking, of the whole affair. Your wife returning suggests that if the dinner is to be eaten at all, it had better be begun. She evidently considers that in pretending to expect him, you have merely been playing a part, and that it would have been manlier and more straightforward for you to have admitted at the beginning that you had forgotten to invite him. During the soup and the fish, you recount anecdotes of his unpunctuality. By the time the entree arrives, the empty chair has begun to cast a gloom over the dinner, and with the joint the conversation drifts into talk about dead relatives. On Friday, at a quarter past eight, he dashes to the door and rings violently. Hearing his voice in the hall, you go to meet him. Sorry I'm late, he sings out cheerily. Fool of a cabman took me to Alfred Place instead of... Well, what do you want now you are come? You interrupt, feeling anything but genially inclined towards him. He's an old friend, so you can be rude to him. He laughs and slaps you on the shoulder. Why, my dinner, my dear boy, I'm starving. Oh, you grunt in reply. Well, you go and get it somewhere else, then. You're not going to have it here. What the devil do you mean, he says. You asked me to dinner. I did nothing of the kind, you tell him. I asked you to dinner on Thursday, not on Friday. He stares at you incredulously. How did I get Friday fixed in my mind? inquiringly. 
because yours is the sort of mind that would get Friday firmly fixed into it when Thursday was the day, you explain. I thought you had to be off to Edinburgh tonight, you add. Great Scott, he cries, so I have. And without another word, he dashes out, and you hear him rushing down the road, shouting for the cab he has just dismissed. As you return to your study, you reflect that he will have to travel all the way to Scotland in evening dress, and will have to send out the hotel porter in the morning to buy him a suit of ready-made clothes, and are glad. Matters work out still more awkwardly when it is he who is the host. I remember being with him on his houseboat one day. It was a little after twelve, and we were sitting on the edge of the boat, dangling our feet in the river, when the spot was a lonely one, halfway between Wallingford and Day's Lock.